the sons of Ragnar burned our old capital, taking away our king in chains, a slave. It would take more than that to silence the spirit of the old north. With your ascension to the throne comes a new dawn, a new capital. We will have our revenge on the Vikings. Their blood will feed our soil. The North will be ours once more. Your name will echo through the centuries. Avenge your ancestor. Hello everybody and welcome to Thrones of Britannia. This is Ken VHS with a let's play of one of my favorite games uh, in the Total War series, actually. This is a game which has been uh, quite polarizing for a few reasons, and I hope over the course of this series to show you why I think it works so well. Uh, we're playing Stratclute here. We're going to give this a shot at very hard, very hard, very hard. There are three toggles for campaign difficulty in this game. You've got the campaign difficulty itself, uh, you've got the battle difficulty, and then you've got politics, which is, uh, I think this is a first for a, the Total War game to allow you to determine how hard or easy the politics aspect of the game is. So let's actually begin by taking a look at that. So we're playing uh, Stratclute, which is a Northern Welsh faction, or a North British faction more precisely. This is, I believe, the smallest start on the map. Uh, you don't have a full province even at the beginning of the campaign. Uh, every other faction has at least one province, in many cases two, or maybe more. But Stratclute, we are missing one here. We're missing Dundomnall. This is in the hands of Westernus, our soon-to-be enemy, uh, because we will be uh, we will be trying to take back or to take all of this area. But the politics problem is going to be illustrated by our first notification here on the left. We have a character with low loyalty, so let's take a look at his problem. Uh, he has a loyalty of one. And a part of this, as you can see by looking at the contributing factors, is that he is more influential than the ruler. That's giving him a minus two debuff. His influence is sitting at seven. Our ruler, uh, Rune here, I think is how you might say that, has an influence of five. So to deal with this problem, we could handle it in a couple of different ways. Uh, one, we could just be uh, ruthless and assassinate uh, this character just get him off the board completely. That's going to cost us 1,602 gold pieces, uh, which is more than we're making currently, and it's a substantial chunk of our current treasury. Also, I think this guy is pretty decent. He's our only governor. He's got four quills for governance. That's giving him some construction cost uh, bonuses, some corruption uh, bonuses as well. And he's got some decent traits. He's contributing a lot to our food supply, with this farmer trait. He's also completing, uh, contributing to our diplomacy uh, as being a politician and our research rate. If we get some other bonuses to the, the rate of research, we're gonna see some actual uh, significant uh, increases to our technology research rate. So we don't want him to just leave the map. We want to try to, uh, try to keep him around and keep him happy. Now we could attempt to lower his influence, his influence sitting at 7. If we were to try to lower it, that may get it down to 5, which would be just about enough uh, to, to solve the problem. However, this can backfire. Like all of the political actions, there's not a guarantee of success with lowering the influence. So the, the king could get some bad traits as a result. This character could get some, some negative traits. He could become more disloyal. Uh, it could end up costing us a lot more money to attempt this uh, over and above the 513 that is displayed here. So you do have to be cautious when engaging in politics. The other thing we could do uh, would be to try to secure his loyalty. That would bump it up by one or two, potentially. Again, there's a bit of, uh, a bit of randomness here. You never know exactly how these things are going to turn out. Uh, this feels sometimes a bit safer, but the problem is it may have repercussions in that your other governors and generals may want a piece of the pie. If you're throwing around money in an attempt to secure some in individual's loyalty, they want to get that as well. 
So there's a lot to sort of keep track of here. One thing that I like to try early in the game as a fairly cheap and relatively safe option is the Seek Wife, uh, because there is a chance that you can get a character, uh, some good character traits through the wives that you might uh, get. So let's roll the dice here and see what we come up with. Uh, okay, she's ugly. Which in itself is not necessarily uh, a, a bad thing. Uh, so so sh this is decreasing his zeal, uh, which is not not terrible. It's not good, of course, but it's, it's not terrible. Decreases the chance of having children, increases the chance of having illegitimate children. So yeah, we're going to turn her down. Now we could roll the dice again and take her hand. What sometimes happens when your character gets married is that in the aftermath of that he gets a temporary bonus to his loyalty because he's just so happy uh, with his new wife so that's something that that sometimes it does help we're gonna hold off because I think we'll be okay in the short term uh, rune again is sitting at five influence and if we can just get him up by a couple of points this character here is going to experience uh, an increase of his loyalty by by plus two. He's going to lose that minus two malice for being more more influential than the ruler. So I think we will risk it. In terms of our other family, um, actually, I'm noticing that we don't have any wife for our king currently, uh, but I think we can wait because we can do some stuff to take care of it. Let's engage in diplomacy here. Diplomacy in thrones is quite important, actually, uh, because as we'll see. It's one of the tools you have in your pocket for making sure that the AI can't march willy-nilly through your territory. Uh, Thrones handles settlements uh, in a revolutionary way compared to other current uh, Total War titles, and uh, that itself is, is one of the most polarizing changes in the game. But one of the ways that you have to shore up your defenses is by diplomatic ties. And if we look around at where we're located here, as we saw, we are missing one settlement that would complete the province uh, of Stratclute itself, or the region of, uh, yeah, the province of Stratclute. And that's this one here, which is in the hands of this faction, Westerness. Now, this is a very attractive settlement. Uh, for one big reason, it is a farm. Food is crucial in Thrones of Britannia, not only to maintaining the upkeep of certain buildings, but also for your armies. Every single unit in your army requires 10 food in the treasury. And that is a limited resource. You can increase it, of course, by building certain buildings, by researching certain texts, by getting traits and getting followers. But the easiest way is to capture farms for yourself. And so what you want to do is look around the map and see where is that food uh, located. It could be farms, it could also be uh, fishing. We've got a fishing village over here. It's actually a combination fishing and silver village. So this is contributing to our food currently, but we really want to secure this. However, doing so, if we look at Westerness here and check out their diplomatic ties, they are the vassal kingdom of North Laod, which is our large neighbor to the east. And for all the talk in the intro video of us getting revenge on the Vikings, it's actually these two English kingdoms that are going to be the big thorn in our side for the early game. And in fact, we may want to uh, mirror history a little bit and ally with the Vikings in an attempt to form a block against English aggression. This actually happened, and um, if you're interested in the history of Strathclyde, I can recommend a book, I recommend a book by uh, Tim Clarkson. It's called Strathclyde uh, and the Anglo-Saxons in the Viking Age. It is a great, uh, straightforward account of uh, the, the sort of narrative events of history of Strathclyde and the region, uh, and I recommend it very highly just for getting a good sense of the era and the region itself. So I don't think what we want to do is try to establish diplomatic ties with these factions. We're going to be going to war with them soon. What we want to secure is the northern side of our border because we don't want trouble with these uh, other uh, these Gaelic kingdoms, these other Scottish factions, and if we want to, we want to avoid trouble with the Sea King Vikings to our north and west. So let's start with opening, opening diplomatic ties with Kirkin here. This is the largest uh, Scottish faction, I guess, for lack of a better word, although we are technically in modern-day Scotland ourselves. We have a pretty good relationship with Kirkin. I think this is in part because we have, uh, yes, a diplomatic marriage with Kirkin. Now, this is uh, historical as well, I believe, 
that the sister of the current king was Rune's wife or something along those lines. So there is some diplomatic uh, marriage going on between us. We don't have any formal relationship, though. Their king despises the Viking Sea Kings. He's defensive, which is good for us, and ethics matter, which means he's very likely to join his allies in war. So these could all be good things if we can get him on side. So let's see. We'll start this with a uh, declaration of friendship here. That's sufficient. All right, and let's see if we can go another step forward. Maybe, uh, maybe a defensive pact. A reasonable arrangement. All right, so that means now if we uh, are invaded by another faction, by say Galgoidal here, Kirken will most likely uh, declare war on them as well, which is very, very nice. It's going to keep them uh, busy potentially. Now, I don't know if we want to go for anything else. A military access, we could get it, but the problem is this drags them into wars, although it does drag them into our wars as well. So, okay, so there's a bit of a back and forth here. If Kirkin declares war on, say, Orkney, which they are likely to do at some point, then we would be called to join them in that fight. And that leaves us open to aggression from Orkney uh, and their allies, uh, Sudrayar and potentially Galgoidal and Divlin and who knows. All sorts of stuff could happen as a result of Kirkin declaring some war on some Vikings to the north. On the other hand, we could try that to our advantage by attacking North Laod and trying to get Kirkin to help us. But you know what? I think we'll stick around with the diplomatic, uh, the defensive pact, rather. I think we'll call that good for Kirkin. Let's see what the other factions have to offer. So this is Athfolklaw. This is, okay, they're already in a military alliance with Kirkin, so they're feeling pretty good about us. A welcome sight. Um, what can all I do right, we can do a declaration of friendship here. We agree. And we can arrange a marriage. Ooh. Ooh, this is good. Okay, so we can arrange a marriage because our king's wife is currently sadly deceased. And so we could arrange a marriage potentially with, uh, with, with uh, Athfolkla's, one of their daughters or something along these lines. This is, the most important thing here is the plus one influence for our king. The governance, the plus 10% income one governing, that's not going to be useful because we're going to keep Rune in the field. But I will take that plus one influence. Uh, yes, indeed. Okay, great. So that's going to already start uh, helping our loyalty issue with that uh, slightly rebellious character. So I don't know if we can get anything else going here, a defensive pact with them. No, nope, that's insulting. All right, that's fine. Uh, we can arrange a marriage again. Hmm. All right, so Denewald, this is, I believe, our heir... And he's got, let's see, a plus two command, plus uh, three stars, uh, or three quills, rather, for governance. So sh so this is going to actually hurt his command, but increase his armor and melee skill. So it's kind of a double-edged thing here. Let's see if how likely this is. Because honestly, you know, having a, having a very high command... Hmm. Is it better for him to be a very protected fighter? Let's see, maybe we can get a little bit of money out of this. Or something else, military access. That could allow us potentially to come up and assist them, or it would allow them to come down and assist us. You know what? Let's do it. We've got a couple of wives. Have they got any more, <laughs> any more wives lying around? Nope. Okay, so we've got our king and our heir squared away in terms of marriage. So I think, I think that's a pretty good place to leave it. Let's check out Fort True here. I hope you repay my uh, let's see. Now, these guys tend to be vulnerable in the early game. Uh, Orkney tends to attack them. Kirkin tends to come up, and they tend to be fighting a lot around Fortress territory. So they probably right. won't be around for very long. Persuade me. No harm in getting a, a, a declaration of friendship at any rate. And I think we'll just call that good. Galgoidal... Yeah, so they don't like us. This is a Sea Kings faction, and as such, they don't have any other friends right now, but they're going to be uh, sympathetic, let's say, to the, the other Vikings of the Western Isles and Orkney. So I think we're just going to have to hope for the best regarding them. I don't think we'll be able to get anything like a declaration of friendship, I mean, without spending a lot of money. Let's just see how much that would cost us. Okay, 2500 
1650 is intriguing. So yeah, it would it would cost more than that. I don't think I want to spend the money right now. What I think we'll do instead is just keep an eye on things because we actually start with a couple of armies here. And this is the moment when it might be good to talk about that settlement system. Our, uh, our old capital, for those of you familiar with the history of this, uh, was Alt Clute back just prior to the start date of, uh, of the game here, 878 AD. I think it was 875 or so. Uh, Alt Clute was besieged by Vikings probably from Dublin, something along those lines, besieged for months, uh, and the inhabitants eventually were, were starved out or something along those lines and uh, apparently a bunch of them taken away as slaves. This is where the, the legend grew up that the king of Strathclyde was, was taken back to Dublin and killed on the instigation of some other Scottish faction. Not really sure if there's any truth to that, but it was true that the Strathclyde dynasty moved back to Govan, uh, which became their capital. And in fact, apparently there's a museum or something there to this day where you can see some of these, uh, these hogback monuments, these um, very intricate stone-carved I think they're, they're sarcophagi, essentially, or tomb markers, something like that. So, in any case, I have not been to see them myself. If you're in the area, it might be worth worth the trip. But this is a unique building for us. Uh, this is available in our major settlement, uh, Govan, which is, of course, our new capital. Now, as a capital, the main settlement of a province, this is the only settlement with a garrison. And this is the major point of contention for people uh, with regards to Thrones of Britannia, that the minor settlements, Alt Clute itself, Sreth Belen, uh, and, you know, other minor settlements like this farming village here that we're going to capture probably in this episode, uh, don't have any garrisons. They don't even have basic defenses. If I were to park an army inside Alt Clute and wait for an assault, I would be fighting just another field battle with some buildings off to the side. This is not typically a place that you can use to any sort of defensive um, advantage. And for a lot of players, this was a, a, uh, a very kind of unpleasant change. It meant that you could no longer cheese your way through siege defenses while the enemy, uh, you know, sent men against your walls. So your minor settlements no longer had that, you know, few garrison troops that you could hold up in the, in the town center and, and try to eke out a win. In my view, that's great. Annoying siege battles after siege battles, they just get tedious. Uh, and the sieges in Thrones are actually fantastic. They've done a great job with the large settlement layouts to create some very innovative and interesting and engaging siege maps for you to fight on. So when you do fight them, uh, it's quite a highlight. And I think they did a great move here by getting rid of these minor garrisons in the minor villages. But the other impact of that it means that you can literally walk into an enemy village and just take it like when I defeat this rebel army here I can just march into Dundomnall and take it and get all of the food that's being produced here no problem again for a lot of players that seems too easy on the other hand it's not an exploit if the AI can do it to you there's nothing preventing this army here from marching over and arriving at Altklut and just capturing all of these resources from me and so I think this is why, if you look at the Steam reviews, you'll see some amusing uh, back and forth. Players on the one hand say, oh, the game is too easy, it's a walkover, you can just cheese it, which is absolutely true. I mean, you could theoretically just get a bunch of one-unit generals and, and march them into, into enemy territory and capture some stuff, but at the same time, the AI is going to do it back to you. So you'll see the same reviewers sometimes say, oh, well, this is not fair because enemies can just march into your territory and, you know, use the same tactic that I just used against them. If you're playing it roughly as intended, I think what you, what you learn is that you've got to defend a lot with a little, and that means that for the first time ever with the 3D map, army placement is absolutely crucial. Those minor settlement garrisons that you could rely on to cheese out a siege victory are gone. So you have to do, uh, you have to pay a great deal of attention to your field armies. Well, I've rambled on enough about that. So let's jump into our first battle here with the rebels. This is going to be a fairly balanced fight. We'll take a look at what the uh, what the armies are going to consist of in a moment here. Every uh, Every faction has this initial battle uh, in Thrones. You've got some rebels in your territory, you've got to take over them, and you get a public order bonus and some replenishment bonuses uh, for, for defeating these forces. So it's, 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 a, it's a kind of a gamey thing that they added. 
uh, but it does get you into the action fairly quickly. Now it looks like we have a very even force here. We've got each two archers, two melee infantry, and two cavalry. I do think I have the edge though in the cav because these are uh, Old North horsemen, I believe, and these are, oh, so I think, Welsh horsemen or scouts. They are a sort of a lighter version, so I think we should have really no trouble. The only thing I'm slightly worried about is the experience on their enemy general here, although we do outnumber them with our general. So I think with a bit of positioning, we should be in a, in a pretty good spot to uh, take out the rebels and then grab our first territory and see what happens as a result. We can just attack in the dry weather here. That'll be fine. All right, and the units and thrones, I think, look quite good. Um, Stratclude is maybe not the best representative of it. You get a lot of uh, a lot of just red-clothed dudes at the beginning. But as we tech up, we're going to start seeing some nice-looking armor on these guys, uh, and it will be quite impressive. I guess our our uh, our cav looks pretty decent as well. The the old North Horseman. Of course, this does use the Warscape engine, and for an old Total War veteran like me, uh, I do miss the collision on the uh, the older games like like uh, Rome 1, even Medieval 2, where units would actually properly, you know, run into each other. But in any case, let's get this battle going. We've got uh, guerrilla deployment on these old North, North horsemen, which is nice, but not super useful when we don't have a lot of them to begin with. I think what we'll do is just move these guys up here and try to grab some high ground. They're probably going to do about the same to us. Looks like they're waiting, actually, so... We can go ahead and speed this up. Already hitting us with archers. Archers, pierce their hearts. Pound the ground. Faster horsemen. Don't see their general yet. There he comes. Fire at will. Combat's in our blood. I want my spearmen down there to ward off the enemy general, and we'll just actually. Let's turtle up with our swordsmen there. Now, as uh, Strathclyde, we're going to benefit from some quite good archers. I just saw the cab there. There we go. And cavalry. Those are going to be kind of our signature things. We also get decent spears and, uh, you know, some all right infantry all around, but we're not going to get the really heavy hitting uh, axe infantry that the Viking factions get. All right, I think that's the end of their cav. Get our riders around the back there. Their general. All right, let's hit the Axemen with our swords. And we'll get out of skirmish here. All right, looks like the General's trying to poach our archers. I think we got him with our spearmen. So 
actually, let's hit them in the back with our general. And I'll leave my lighter calf to deal with the archers. We want to get all of these routers uh, off the field if possible, uh, because it would be nice to just eliminate this army and not have to chase it down off the map. We are going to get hit by spears. So we'll try that again. Let's hit those spears with our swords. All right, there goes the general. I don't think we've killed him, though. There he goes. Got some friendly fire shooting into that. So these are Levy Axemen. I think we'll be all right. We'll chase these guys down. All right, we do want to uh, to clean this all up as much as possible. But yeah, Battles and Thrones, uh, quite good. You know, if you can deal, if you can, if you can uh, deal with the lack of of collision, I guess. Uh, but no, they they're pretty functional. It's, it's funny because people talk about the battles as being the strong point of this game and, you know, they're, they're fine. They work. Uh, I would say it's the campaign, which is precisely what, what many players seem to think is, is the, the bad part about Thrones. So, at any rate, we'll clean this up and then get back to the campaign map uh, where I'm hoping that we will have eliminated the enemy army. Yeah, I mean, I really think uh, I really think that would do it. They've got, I think, one cavalry unit uh, that made it off the field. So I'm hoping we uh, completed our mission goals uh, just by dealing with that. Oh yeah, yeah. So I did, <laughs> I did spring for blood DLC. So yes, I am part of the uh, the problem here. Okay, so we have the option here to ransom release, take on warriors, kill captives. I guess. I guess uh, take on warriors. May as well do that. Okay, so now we got our first real mission after completing the uh, the kill the rebels one, and it's eliminate westerness. So indeed, we are going to war with the English in an attempt to take back the old north. Now this is going to increase our heroism by ten. Heroism is indicated up here by this bar. There's a lot of uh, different mechanics for the different factions in Thrones, and some of it is kind of gamey to be honest. Heroism is one of those. Uh, that that is, I don't know. It's it's the least engaging in my view, in some ways, because there's really not any choice you have to make about it. It's just you get bonuses for doing things like winning battles, owning Welsh land, ranking up characters. I mean, these are things that you'd be doing anyway, and so it's nice that I get a little bonus for doing it. But it doesn't make me feel like it's something I'm really trying to to engage with. I'm not making any hard decisions about it. Contrast to this, for example, with the uh, Hera King mechanic for the Great Army factions, or even the Tribute mechanic for the Viking Sea Kings, uh, or the the Burgle mechanic for the English. These are things that you have to sort of deal with and manage up or down, uh, like legitimacy for the Gaelic faction. So in any case, uh, heroism is just there. We'll be taking the, uh, the bonuses from it, so that's all good. So thanks to our successful uh, defeat of those rebels, we've got plus five public order in all of our regions and plus 50% unit replenishment, which is very important because we are going to war. And here we go, walking into an enemy settlement. And yes, indeed, the game wants us to make sure we know what we're doing. We're going to be declaring war on Westerness, and almost certainly North so, Laod is going to be joining the them in that down. fight. We obey. All right, now we're going to go ahead and occupy that. It's going to get us yet yes. more replenishment. And, and indeed, now we've got a, a whole other mission to eliminate North Leo. That's going to increase our heroism by another 10. Now, we do not need to complete all of these missions. They're just going to give us bonuses if we do. But it, you know, it might be a good idea to do that. On the other hand, it may be a good idea to stop short of eliminating certain factions, maybe to vassalize them, maybe to get a peace deal at certain times, because in Thrones, diplomacy actually works. 
Now, I haven't played Three Kingdoms, but I've heard great things about the diplomacy in that game. Uh, and my experience in Thrones is that it, apparently it's fairly similar. Uh, diplomacy does function. You can get peace with factions. Uh, I'm playing on very hard here uh, for the campaign difficulty, as I said. And still, diplomacy is something that you really want to engage with, and in some cases, it can be an excruciating choice. Do I eliminate this faction and get the bonuses uh, thanks to the, the mission that I've been given, or do I need to vassalize them instead to maintain a buffer between the stronger neighbor? Uh, so, in any case, lots of tough decisions to make. Now, we're capturing this farm has done a couple of things. One, it has completed the province of Stratclute, which in itself is just very nice, but it's also given us this rich farmland. So we were at 35 food, I think, and now we've got 76. What this means now is that we can recruit up to seven more units, but now the decision is where do we recruit them? We do want to come down here and capture this territory. And let's take a look at our objectives for why that is. If you go to our victory conditions, uh, we have a few options here, and I do love this as well uh, about Thrones, because the victory conditions uh, feel very thematic. For all of the factions, they're a little bit different. Kingdom victory for us is going to be fairly typical. Capture these territories, uh, either owning them yourself or through vassals. So these are places where we would naturally tend to expand if you're following anything like a historical approach to the game. I, however, want to try the short fame victory. This does require you to do a little conquering. We're going to have to take uh, the Palace of the Mountain, so that's in Edinburgh, the Cathedral of St. Ring, and I think that's down here in Huitanerna, and a royal monastery. The nearest one is going to be on the island of Iona off to our northwest. So we capture those places, we build these buildings, and we get so much fame, uh, which is measured by you know certain buildings, certain texts. Then we will get a short fame victory. To get the long fame victory, we'd have to do all of that and capture, let's see, territory in, uh, in uh, Northumbria, Ireland, and Scotland. So again, we'd have to go a little bit further afield, but pretty reasonable, all told. So because of that, this is on our, uh, on our menu. We need to grab this, and since this is part of the province of Cumberland, and since that historically was part of the realm of Strathclyde most likely, we will be heading down here. We want to grab Carlisle, a very important old Roman settlement. Uh, and uh, and yeah, that's going to be where we go. But we do have a, uh, an army of Westerners down to the south here. It's only got four units in it currently, but this is only the first turn. This is going to grow, and they're probably going to send it after us pretty soon. So we have to decide where we're going to disperse our units. And since we're also at war with North Laod, we have to keep an eye on them. So I think the best approach is going to be a somewhat split force. So why don't we get our army out uh, a little bit over here. Kind of threatening some of these settlements. We can put him into uh, a, a fortify stance. That will allow us to recruit units in the field. And we can see what we can get here. So this is our air, I believe. And let's see, we have uh, we have the option of recruiting a couple more archers. We can get some cav, that might be a good thing to work on. But let's see, let's go for one more archer in this army. Let's definitely get some cav. I think I'll go for some old north horsemen. And I want some tougher infantry. Well, we already have some swords. Let's go for uh, let's go for another spear unit then. And I think we'll call that there. That's seven. Here we've got six. So if we go for four, that'll get us a nice even ten. I think we want to load up on cav. This will be pretty expensive. But it'll also be good. And then we'll we'll get our fourth unit here with these uh, Welsh armored axemen. So this is as good as we're going to get in terms of axe infantry. We don't get the two-handed axe units. Um, but that is what we will get. And because we, uh, we just recruited them, they're going to be very under strength. So this, I think, is also a new mechanic for thrones. When you train units, 
they, they appear instantly, but at a smaller unit size, and they replenish over time. That means you have to be thinking a few turns ahead. Okay, I don't need an army right now necessarily, but I do know that this army is going to grow, and we're going to need to have enough men to deal with it, and potentially anything else that comes out of the fog of war. Now that that's all dealt with, we can see if we can build anything, and we did spend a lot of cash on recruiting, so the only thing we can upgrade is a potter here in alt Clute. Now, this settlement is feeling somewhat vulnerable here because Galgoidal may attack us, um, but I think we want to upgrade it anyway. All these minor settlements have two options for upgrade paths. Uh, sometimes it's one option is going to give you more uh, resources, like food, but at the expense of a little less cash than the other option. In some cases, it'll give you public order bonuses or, or other things. In this case, we've got certain types of income bonuses versus certain other types of income bonuses. So the pottery seller is going to increase commerce type income, whereas the potter is going to increase industry type income. Um, so this, this affects all regions in adjacent provinces, and since that's the case, we may want to look at these adjacent provinces to see what types of income they produce. Let's see, not a lot of commerce I'm seeing, but I believe down here there is some industry. Yes, that's, that's industry down there. This is also commerce. So let's go with the industry option because in the short run, that's going to give us more cash anyway. 118 income. So let's go with that and end the turn. All right, North Laod is already coming up, and there we go. That four-unit army has grown to nine. We may also want to make contact with some of these Irish factions. For the glory of the right, let's see. Okay, so... One of our generals got the self-sustaining trait. Uh, this gives him a plus 1% to unit replenishment. All of that does add up. Now, this uh, does tell you, I love that the, uh, in Thrones, the traits always let you know how they were, how they were uh, assigned. So this is gained from the granary building chain. And that is, of course, in our capital here. And uh, that's, that's just good to know. Okay, so we have a war already between Athokla and Galgoidal. So I'm, I'm thinking that uh, our defensive pact ally Athokla declared war, because otherwise we would be asked to join that fight. That's good to see. I'm hoping that they do some damage to these guys, keep them busy, and off our back. Other warfare is going on in Ireland, so it shouldn't concern us. What does concern us is these armies. So now we need to make some decisions about where to where to send our troops. It looks like this army is heading over to the west, and they may be heading up the road to meet us in the field. Let's go ahead and bring our army down. We'll go ahead and uh, use all the movement points. That will uh, still leave us in our territory, so we'll be able to replenish. And hopefully we can uh, force the issue in the next couple of turns and eliminate this stack. Uh, doing so will basically leave them open. Over here, though, yeah, let's see. Oh, we can't quite reach Aberkernig. Shoot. All right. Let's get up here to Sreth Bellin. Let's at least upgrade these guys. Now, we've got seven units in the stack to their 11, and so I'm not, I'm not feeling too good about that matchup. On the other hand, those are probably new recruits as well. So they'll be facing a very, uh, a very fresh or full, uh, you know, army, even though our unit numbers are lower, and I don't think they're replenishing while at sea. That would be very odd if they were. So we'll just have to wait for our buildings to complete, but let's see if there's anything we need to do diplomatically at the moment. Um, I am curious how, how strong Galgoidal is. Yeah, they're quite a bit stronger. Actually, we're quite a bit stronger than they are. So that's pretty good. All right, let's just end the turn.
All right, here they come. They shed a unit. So that's interesting. The the AI will actually disband or or maybe merge units. My deeds increase my renown. All right, so it sounds like we've got uh, another trait. Okay, so we've got more war going on in the south. Not a problem, but oh, we've got a skill available. Ah, yes, and this was for our formerly disloyal governor of Strat Clute. Uh, he is now sitting at three loyalty, and that's because he is no longer more influential than the ruler. So Rune has increased his influence, which is great news. Now, the way you increase characters in Thrones uh, is not so much by skill trees, but by followers. So you can either sort of add these guys to your retinue or improve them. It's kind of a neat, uh, very role-play friendly mechanic. And one that, that, uh, that might be a good option for him is the priest. This would ensure that uh, he has a bit more loyalty. This also increases the faction allegiance and decreases the, the, the public order in a local enemy province. That's not going to apply to him because he's never going to be in an enemy province as a governor. But at higher levels, as we increase uh, his priest follower trait, this will eventually decrease the enemy campaign movement range in the local province. And you can, I, I don't know, I sort of justify this as representing a network of priests in, in the province, sort of keeping an eye on enemy movements and helping uh, the villagers to deny the enemy resources or something like that. It's all very abstract, but this is a pretty good option for bumping up the, uh, the loyalty of a potentially wavering governor. All right, so now... We could jump right in and take Aberkernig, and I think I'm going to do that. I can't tell how big the army is here, but if we go ahead, we could make a little bit of cash off of it, which is not going to be good for public order, but we can occupy it now, and we're going to be almost complete with these units next turn. Now, what's here is a Benedictine small priory. The, uh, the, the big exclamation point icon is telling me that this is not really a cultural uh, building, and so it is actually giving me some, some penalties, uh, and it, we need to convert it, but first we need to repair it. I'm not going to bother repairing it. Uh, we'll see if this causes a rebellion. Hopefully there will be a problem for North Laod as much as it is for us. Uh, but for now, we'll move these guys down and see if we can force a fight, although... Yeah. <clears throat> All right, so this is one of those strategic decisions uh, that is caused and uh, increased by the lack of garrisons in minor settlements. If I move this army down here to press my uh, acclaim into Westernus' territory and face this army, which I could probably beat fairly easily and clean up these couple of provinces, I'm going to be leaving this army of North Laod to march into my territory and grab the farms. That could be a disaster. So I think what we're going to have to do is pull back and play a more defensive game. Um, and that will buy us a bit of time. That will let us do some building, which we badly need to do, actually. We're going to go ahead and upgrade this to the food option, uh, the communal fields. This is going to give us more food than the other option, uh, Lord's Fields. This might be a better choice if we want really the money or an extra agricultural estate to hand out, which is a mechanic we'll be talking about in future episodes. Uh, but we're going to go with this. In four seasons, we'll have... Let's see, what, how much more food is it? Fifteen. So we'll be able to train another couple of units in four more turns. But I'm thinking the ten we've got here, the seven we've got here, should be enough to deal with what North Laod and Westernus combined have to throw at us. So at any rate, I think this is a good point to stop the episode. When we pick up again, we'll be facing some battles with proper factions. We'll be seeing if we can secure and even improve our position on the map. Thank you very much for joining me in this one. I hope you'll stick around to the next one. Until then, take care, everybody.